Today I'm out in northern New Mexico because I have finally gotten my hands on the all-new 2022 Lexus LX600. This is sort of the co-flagship of the Lexus brand, not just the flagship SUV. Starting at $88,245, this has the second highest starting price in the Lexus lineup. And if you want the ultra-luxury version, which I'll show you a little bit later, hopefully, that is going to be $127,000, one of the most expensive Lexus vehicles ever produced. As with the previous generation, this LX is based on the Toyota Land Cruiser. So this has all the off-road durability and dependability that you've come to expect from that brand with a Lexus logo on the front. Now, there is a little bit of a trick. For 2022, the Land Cruiser has also been completely redesigned, but it's no longer sold in the United States. The main reason for that is that the LX outsold the Land Cruiser for the last few years, and it was obvious that it was going to continue with the new generation. And I think quite logically so. If you're going to spend ninety dollars to $100,000 on your next big luxury SUV, I would want the one with the Lexus logo on the front. So if I were torn between Land Cruiser and LX, I've said this before, I would just buy the Lexus LX. In terms of dimensions, this vehicle is very close to the outgoing model, although the style definitely, I think, works better with this generation LX. This large spindle grille seems better integrated into the front end. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. The grille does change depending on the trim that you're in. This model has front parking sensors, front camera system right there. We have full LED headlights standard in all models with the LED turn signals integrated right there, fog lamps down below. I find it very refreshing that Lexus is absolutely not running away from the Land Cruiser DNA baked into the LX600. And on occasion, you'll probably hear me calling this a Land Cruiser, especially when talking about off-roading ability. That is definitely iconic for the Land Cruiser brand. And that's one of the reasons that this vehicle and the Land Cruiser didn't really grow for 2022. At just over 200 inches long, this is almost exactly the same size as the outgoing model. And the wheelbase, the distance between the front wheel and the back wheel remains the same at just over 112 inches. You'll notice that we also have, again, that boxy hood profile up front, but they've made the body itself a little bit longer by really shortening the front end look here. So we no longer have as distinctive of a stick out bumper on the front or especially in the rear that maximizes the body space for a body that's about 200 inches long. You'll notice this is significantly shorter than something like a BMW X7 or a Mercedes-Benz GLS and that all has to do with the off-road mission of the LX. The bigger the vehicle, the harder it is to get around an off-road course. On the other hand, if you were hoping that this generation LX would turn into sort of a Lexus Escalade, you're going to be disappointed. This is significantly smaller than the Escalade, not to mention the extended wheelbase Escalade. The rear end design definitely gives me a little bit of a Range Rover vibe. Definitely not a bad thing at all when we're talking about an expensive off-road vehicle. The Lexus LX has always been the reliable Range Rover. If you want a vehicle that will go anywhere, but will also be dependable and likely cost you less in terms of maintenance, you're going to want to get this over the Range Rover. Lexus's new thing is to spell their name out across the back rather than have the Lexus logo. We first saw that in the NX, and they've now confirmed that that is going to be migrating onto every Lexus model as it gets redesigned. Full LED brake lights and tail lamp modules back here. You can see the turn signals and LED there. The exhaust tips are tucked up under the bumper, tow hitch receiver right there under under the panel and then I was a little surprised that they bothered to tuck the exhaust up under the rear but then they give a sort of a I guess an homage to an exhaust outlet right there integrated into the bumper. This LX is equipped with the adaptive variable suspension and an adaptive height air suspension. Currently it's at its highest height. Let me go ahead and press the buttons in here to put it into its lowest height mode there. Drop that down then we can see how quickly the vehicle descends. This is definitely faster than the previous generation LX in terms of the air system performance, but it is still a little bit slower than some of the European options. Again, though, you want to take a look at this if you want an air suspension in your next luxury vehicle and you want it likely to be more reliable. That has definitely been something that the LX has been known for generation after generation. In the US, the LX is going to come with just one engine. It's not a 6-liter V8, as its number would indicate. This is instead a 3.5-liter twin-turbo V6. This is essentially a reworked version of the V6 engine that we find in the LS500. Why is this an LX600, not an LX500? I have no idea there. But it produces 409 horsepower, 479 pound-feet of torque, which is definitely a healthy number for a vehicle this size. It's worth noting the LX has also lost weight in this transition, nearly 500 pounds of curb weight lost. This engine is mated to a standard four-wheel drive system. What's interesting about this is that like some of the other luxury off-roaders out there, this actually has a true center differential, not just a transfer case with the clutch pack in it. This uses a Torsten center differential. And in the rear, you can get an optional limited slip differential, but that is not standard. 
Also interesting, there is no locker available in the front or in the rear of the LX for any price. If you want one, you're gonna have to go aftermarket and there are definitely tons of options there available. Fuel economy goes way up thanks to the weight loss and the V6 engine. This now gets 17 miles per gallon combined. That may not sound like a huge improvement over the previous generation LX, but a bump of two to three MPG at this end of the scale actually is enormous. It is much harder to get a massive fuel economy improvement like that than to make a Camry get three more MPG. If you're watching this video outside the United States, don't worry, there is still a diesel engine available in the Land Cruiser family. If you're going to the back of beyond and you want to take a trailer with you, you'll be happy to know that all LX models come standard with 8,000 pounds of towing ability. But oddly enough, no integrated trailer brake controller. Although I've only been able to spend a day with the new LX, front seat comfort definitely appears to be improved over the outgoing model. We have a four-way adjustable lumbar support here, power extending thigh cushion, three position memory over there on the door, and a memory linked power tilt telescopic steering column. Although it is worth noting that this seat does not have the same range of motion as the seats that we find in the Lexus LS. On the other hand, if you're a taller driver, you're probably gonna like the LX. In addition to a lot of headroom, we have this power extending thigh cushion that makes the seat bottom cushion extremely long. Even though the LX is about the same size on the outside, the body itself has become a little bit longer, like I said before, and that means that we get improved legroom. We have about four to five inches more combined legroom in this than the previous version, depending on exactly how you calculate it. This is also a pretty wide vehicle, even though it is on the short side for a full-size SUV, the width is definitely comparable to something like the Navigator or Escalade, and you will certainly notice that if you move over to the middle seat, where there is a lot of room, and the center console is definitely very wide. Versus most SUVs around the same size as the LX, the bench in the back is wider and therefore more comfortable, especially if you plan on putting three people across or mixing adults and child seats. This model has four zone climate control. There's some air vents and controls right there in the center console. It also has heated and ventilated outboard seats and manual window shades on the side. I have to say, I was also a little bit surprised that these window shades are manual, even in the top end $127,000 version, when we have powered window shades in the Lexus LS. A dual screen rear seat entertainment system is available and it's running basically a version of the software that the main infotainment system is running in the center of the dashboard. Now let's tackle the third row. The second row seats fold and then tumble forward in a very traditional SUV fashion. So as you can see, you could not leave a child seat latched into place and still access the third row. Improving cargo practicality, however, the second row seat is a 40-20-40 folding design so you can fold the center section down and pass longer cargo through easily. Now for the third row itself. It is a power third row. We can press these buttons over here to fold them back into place, or there's some buttons back there in the cargo area that you can use as well. The third row has a really interesting design where the seat bottom cushion actually slides under the back cushion and in the cargo area there when that seat is stowed. Keep in mind, of course, the dimensions of the LX. This is not as big as a GLS or X7, so clearly the third row is going to be a little bit tighter. And you should know that the second row seats do not go forward and backward to try and trade rear passenger room a little bit more equitably. So that seat is back in its position. And as you can see, I basically have to be cross-legged back here in order to fit in the third row. There are two reasons for that. The LX is still a body on frame SUV. So when you take a look at the outside of the vehicle, keep in mind that not all that space is available to you as a passenger. There is a frame between the road and the interior of the vehicle. Also, there's a full size spare tire basically under this third row. And that's what eats up some of that room. But this is still larger and more comfortable than the previous generation. These headrests fold forward. They're pretty big. If I put them into position, I can't really put my head back there towards the headrest, but if I were to try and sit in sort of a more normal upright position, I could do this for a while. And the rear seat backs do have a power recline functionality to them. When it comes to child seats, there are no latch anchors or top tether anchors for the third row. You will only find those in the second row. And I should mention that the latch anchors in the second row do hit me in kind of an odd place in the small of my back as an adult. Let me know if you've been able to sit in an LX and you find the same thing. If we go in for a closer look, you can see that the latch anchors for the second row are underneath that little flap there, and it does kind of pop out a little bit. You can see that it affects the shape of that seat bottom cushion. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that I am in the premium trim, which is sort of a mid-level trim. Lexus expects this to be one of the best-selling models. We have a pretty standard-sized moonroof right there over the driver and front passenger's head. Up in the ceiling, we have air vents for the second and third row of passengers. You can see the manual side shades there. There's some speaker grills right there above that door handle. 
You can see also the rear seat entertainment system, four-way adjustable headrests, height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. The new front seat design is a little bit thinner than before that helps improve rear seat legroom. But again, I think these seats are definitely more comfortable than the outgoing models. These seats are both heated and ventilated, leather upholstery as you can see right there. Lots of perforations on the seat bottom cushion, but not terribly aggressive bolstering on the seat back or the seat bottom cushion. Lexus offers a number of different interior color options. However, I was only able to sample the charcoal interior. If you get the very top end trim, then charcoal is the only option. Zooming in here closer on the Mark Levinson speaker grill, you can see it has a really cool pattern that goes for the speaker grills on the front doors and on the rear doors. One weird thing with this particular trim, especially given it's over $100,000 price tag, and that would be the model that I'm driving right now, no memory seats for the passenger over there on the passenger door. We do have some storage down there on the bottom of that door. The upper section of the dash is a traditional slush molded piece that definitely improves durability over a stitched leather dashboard. You can see that it's been after stitched to dress it up a little bit. Then below that we have a stitched section of imitation leather. It's definitely nice and squishy right there. Also soft touch plastics on things like that glove box door. The glove compartment itself is a pretty accommodating slot style glove compartment, but I would not be able to fit a 10 inch tablet computer inside. The bulk of the dashboard has a definitely different style than the previous generation LX. We have a two screen infotainment setup, so you can see we have a large screen here right on top. It's more of a horizontal style display. Power button for the infotainment system here, start stop button for the engine right down there. If you use Apple CarPlay, then it occupies that entire screen right there. If I go back to the Lexus menu, you'll see that this is the same software that we find in the Lexus NX, only on a different size display. That means that the navigation software is internet connected. If you don't have an internet connection, the navigation software isn't going to work and you have to have a subscription to keep this active. It should be standard for about three years on the Lexus LX. The actual number of years standard for the connected services system varies depending on the model that you get. You see there's a regular media interface, regular phone interface, vehicle settings, things like that all in there. Pretty easy to use. The lower screen is mainly used for climate control and off-road settings. So here we have the climate control menu. You can see you can sync the zones. You can control the rear zones right here from that layout. Over here, we have the off-road settings. It tells you what modes you're in, etc. If you have the adaptive air suspension, you can have it automatically lower itself when you're in park to get in and out of the vehicle more easily. You can disable the adaptive air suspension as well. And then if we engage some of the off-road modes, which are done via the controls down below, you'll see that the screen changes there. So different uh, ATS modes there, hill descent control right over there, the crawl control. If you're in crawl control mode, you then adjust the crawl control with this mode select knob here. Otherwise, the mode select operates as a traditional drive mode setting. If I turn off this crawl control option there, you'll see that I can cycle through sport, sport plus, custom, eco, comfort, etc. Lexus said it was important for their customer base to have a lot of physical controls. So we have lots of physical controls for the air vents, toggles for the temperature, buttons here for the climate concierge, and then buttons down here for those off-road systems rather than simply relying on the touchscreen. We have heated and ventilated seats. Those are separate buttons there. Heated steering wheel, controls over there for the passenger side seats, USB-C and regular USB input, but you don't need those for CarPlay because CarPlay is wireless with the system. To the left of that, we have some other buttons for the four-wheel drive system here. There's a button to lock the center differential, auto brake hold, electric parking brake, Stability control disable, and then these control the adaptive height air suspension. Qi wireless charging mat there, two big cup holders, and then a pretty traditional shifter. Between the front seats, there's a padded center armrest. It opens in two different ways with three different buttons. There's a button over here for the driver to open it that way, one over here for the passenger to open it that way, and then one back here so that way the rear passengers can get into the cool box. This is a refrigerated storage area. You can see that I have a bottle of water in there right now. It will very easily hold a six pack of soda. On the driver's side, we find a full color heads up display well integrated into the dashboard. That's a little bit difficult to show in the strong light today. And then we have a partial LCD instrument cluster. I have to say, I was surprised that this is not a full LCD. This is approximately seven inches or so right here on the driver's side. Functionality wise, this is very similar to the one that we find in the Lexus LS. And then we have some physical gauges on either side for things like the engine temperature, oil pressure right there, voltage, and of course the fuel level. One interesting touch that I noticed is that you don't change the vehicle's active safety software settings or the heads up display using the infotainment system in the center console. Instead, that's done here through the steering wheel controls and this instrument cluster. The steering wheel reminds me a lot of the one that we find in the Lexus LS. There is a wood insert right here on the top and then on the bottom spokes as well. It's a little bit difficult to see because the wood is so dark in this particular car. Paddle shifters on the back, down on the left, and up over there on the right. You'll find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system over here on the right side. That is, again, standard. Track forward, backward, and mode buttons there. 
Then on the left side of the wheel, we have volume up, down, and then the controls for that multifunction LCD instrument cluster. Now let's take a look around the ultra luxury trim. This may be the most expensive Lexus period for 2022. It's $127,000 basically. Back here in the cargo area, you'll notice it's slightly different. We don't have a third row. This just seats four. You can actually see the two back seat thrones right there. Jumping into the back seat right now, I'm behind the driver so I can show you everything here. We have a fixed in place center console, Qi wireless charging mat right there. And then this compartment opens from the side. It gives you two USB ports, a lot of storage area right there, also a headphone jack. Then we have this big screen right here in between. This is very similar to the one that we see in the Lexus LS. A lot of, has a lot of very similar controls as well. So the left seat over here, the one that I'm sitting in, you'll notice it doesn't move in quite the same way as the right seat, logically, because if you don't have a passenger up front, you have a lot more room. So for instance, I can control the front seat right from this button, move that forward. And then I can also have it automatically put things into the most relaxed position with that little button right there. And that folds the front seat forward. You can see right like that. And then it gives the passenger seat a pretty dramatic recline right there in the back. And of course, if you want the next level of comfort, you can lower the ottoman down right out of that seat. Oddly enough, there's a different screen for the left rear passenger and the right rear passenger because that seat moves so far forward, a driver over here could actually see a movie or whatever is playing over there. So it actually has a directional filter on the front of it so you can only see it from that rear seat passenger portion. How do I fit? Well, I'm six feet tall. The seat is definitely very comfortable. I have a lot of room going on up here. And if I flip the camera around, you can see that my feet are not quite touching that seat back. Although if I tippy toe forward, they definitely can. So there's definitely enough room back here for a six foot one or perhaps maybe a six foot two passenger. Anyone taller than that, they are gonna have their legs pretty much digging into that seat back. Also in the touchscreen interface, we have an option for rear passenger massage, both left seat and right seat. This is a pretty aggressive massage. It's just about as good as the front seat massage that we find in a lot of Mercedes products. Back here, we also have lamp options. That's because we have some different reading lamps right back here for the rear passengers, sort of an airplane style directable one. For reasons that I don't fully understand, the passenger seat right back there behind the driver's seat does not move as far rearward as the one that I'm sitting in right here, which is the main reason the seat belt is a little bit different. You can see that this seat belt comes out of this pillar right here, whereas the seat belt on the other side does not come out of here. It actually comes out right back there. Also, there's an extra sunshade for the person on the right side of the back, but for some reason, not one over there on the other side. As you'd expect out of a luxury vehicle that has an off-road mission, I spent my first part of the day out at an off-road park near Santa Fe. Now, Lexus deliberately chose an off-road park that was not overly complicated, to be honest, and they will admit that as well. And there is a really good reason for that. At the moment, only eight North American specification Lexus LX models exist. That is all that exists in the entire world, and they're working to build the models that you'll be able to buy sometime in the first quarter of calendar year 2022. As far as comparisons go, there are a few considerations to remember with the LX. From the factory, this does not have a locking differential in the rear or a locking differential in the front, although you can get it with a limited slip differential in the back. Instead of a locking differential, Lexus employs a brake base system that can send power wherever it's needed across the front axle or across the rear axle. They also give you a trail turn assist feature. You can engage that right here in this touchscreen over here when you're in four low, and it works very similar to the one that we see in the Ford Bronco. It will basically drag one wheel a little bit to help get you around that corner a little bit tighter. Rolling through the rest of the off-road systems, obviously we have the adaptive height suspension. One really nice thing with this adaptive height suspension is we still have a lot of suspension travel when it's in its highest height mode, which I am in right now. Now, there isn't quite as much ground clearance in here as you'll find in a Jeep Grand Cherokee or some of the Range Rover product line because of the design of this drivetrain. And Lexus's and Toyota's decision to make this still a body on frame vehicle, not a unibody vehicle with a fully independent suspension. If I put this into four low, to shift it into neutral, come to a stop here, push this button in. Now I'm going to be in four low, just a second here. It'll automatically raise the vehicle up to its highest ride height. Four low is engaged. Now I can engage the crawl control. Downhill speed control works in four high. If you want crawl control, that's four low only. I then adjust it with the mode select knob here in the dashboard, and you will immediately notice this is significantly smoother 
than any of Toyota and Lexus's attempts at crawl control or speed control in the past. This doesn't have that herky-jerky feel. It doesn't have that sort of spring unloading sound as the vehicle is adjusting the brakes. This is now very quiet, very, very civilized, and very much like the systems that we find in modern Land Rover and Range Rover products. There are occasions where the vehicle kind of does the stop and start thing, but it's not accompanied with that jerkiness and the sound that we found in the last generation, and that's really only when it's in its absolutely slowest setting. In addition to crawl control, this vehicle also has the multi-terrain select system, and that's available in four high and in four low. You can choose between auto, you adjust the mode select button here, dirt, sand, mud, deep snow, and then we can scroll back to auto though. Auto seems to be very capable, whether we're talking about some of the sections out here that are muddy or icy or slick, or going up and down slopes. But again, keep in mind, this doesn't have a true locking differential in the back, so there are going to be situations where something else is gonna be a little bit more capable, unless you modify this aftermarket. Tackling the trails a little bit faster, it's obvious that this suspension was designed with this kind of off-roading in mind. It definitely is a little bit firmer than I might like. I might want something that is just ever so slightly softer, but this soaks up all of the imperfections very, very well. It actually kind of sometimes feels like you're floating along the imperfections. Let's go ahead and slow down there for that dip right there. But as you can see, this does incredibly well. It also is very comfortable out on the road, but I did notice that on washboard pavement, say if you're out on a gravel road or a dirt road, washboard pavement, like this section of the road that I'm gonna be on here, this still is a little bit more jarring than I would like. And I have a feeling that's simply down to the adaptive dampers and the way they're tuned. You'll notice the biggest difference in the new LX out on the road. Acceleration definitely feels swifter than the old V8 engine. You can thank the massive amount of low end torque for that. And of course the 10 speed automatic transmission, which is a really good pairing for this twin turbo V6. Even up here at around 8,000 feet, this vehicle still feels peppy. According to Lexus, this should go zero to 60 in 6.9 seconds. I suspect that at sea level, it may actually be a little bit faster because in my very brief testing here around Santa Fe, I was able to get 6.9 seconds at around 6,000 feet of elevation. So I suspect it's gonna be a little bit swifter down at sea level. Aside from that, it also feels more nimble out on the road. Part of that is because it has lost weight. Again, nearly 500 pounds of weight loss that obviously improves the zero to 60 time and the expected braking distance as well. I expect this is probably gonna be somewhere around 120 feet in terms of stopping distance. Logically has an impact on the handling. Now, Lexus did not stick as wide and as grippy a tire on any version of the LX as we find in some of the European competition. This has 265 width tires on it. I would have liked to have seen something a little bit wider, but again, that's something that you can change yourself aftermarket. This vehicle was definitely designed with lots of room in the wheel wells because you might want to put all-terrain tires on it for more aggressive off-roading, or maybe you want to put wider, grippier tires on it for better on-road handling. The other thing you'll really notice is just the steering and the suspension feel. It's definitely more harmonious, more connected to the driver, and the suspension in this vehicle, which has the adaptive height functionality and the adaptive damping functionality, is definitely better connected. If I put this into its most comfortable mode here, I rotate that drive mode dial, we definitely get a little bit more tip and dive, a little bit more body roll, but it definitely soaks up the bumps a little bit better. As far as preliminary scores go, I would probably give handling a B at this moment. Remember that vehicles like the BMW X5 and X7 and the GLE and the GLS are going to be around this same price range. And there are definitely going to be versions of those vehicles that will handle better in terms of on-road driving dynamics. Now, in terms of off-road ability, generally speaking, this is going to be better and feel better in those off-road situations. The BMW and the Mercedes just tend to be tuned definitely too firm for a lot of rugged off-road work. As far as ride quality and cabin noise go, I fully expect this to get an A. The ride is definitely better polished than the last generation model, and the cabin is very, very quiet. You don't get a lot of road noise, you don't get a lot of wind noise in here, and the engine is very hushed. You do hear a little bit of the V6 sound now and then, but this is a lot quieter in terms of engine noise than the previous LX. At the moment, fuel economy is a little difficult to divine because I haven't been driving this at home. Over a day of mixed driving out here in Santa Fe, I've been averaging about 15 miles per gallon, but I have been going up and over mountain passes like the one that I'm on here. So this isn't exactly the most appropriate situation for a fuel economy test. I certainly expect this to be more efficient than the outgoing LX model. The outgoing LX was honestly pretty inefficient. The engine and transmission combo there, the curb weight of the vehicle, etc. it just wasn't designed with fuel economy in the forefront. 
bottom line out on the road, I wouldn't say the LX has turned over a new leaf. It's not a completely different driving vehicle, but it is a significant improvement over the outgoing model. This is certainly a refinement of what the LX has always been about. Remember, this is a body on frame vehicle. So as far as driving nature goes and the way that this interacts with the road and the steering, etc., this is going to be more similar to something like the Wagoneer and the Escalade and the Navigator than a GLS or an X7 because those are unibody vehicles. So things are going to feel a little bit more tight, a little bit more connected, a little sportier feeling out on the road. This is going to have a slightly more relaxed demeanor. For 2022, the Lexus LX is going to start at $86,900 plus a $1,345 destination fee. I actually got the price tag just a little bit wrong at the beginning of the video. I included the destination when I said I did not. So $186,900 plus the destination. That's going to buy you the base model with five passenger seating, 20 inch wheels, leather upholstery, power rear hatch, the same infotainment system that we find in this model and four zone automatic climate control. That's actually a reasonably good deal because the price tag escalates pretty rapidly from that point on. The base model really is intended for the person that wanted a Land Cruiser and the Land Cruiser is no longer available according to Lexus. If you want some of the schnazzier leather, the upgraded wood, the fancier audio systems, you're going to find those in the upper end trims. The next step from there is the premium trim. That's where you get the first seven seat model. $95,000 for that one, and you get heated front seats. From that point on, we get the F Sport trim, which has the F Sport appearance, a different grille up front. It definitely looks more aggressive. I also think it's actually a little bit more cohesive with the design rather than this large chrome thing going on here. That model gets you 22 inch wheels and a performance suspension. If you want everything that you've seen in this video so far today, you're going to want the luxury trim that starts at $103,000. That gets you the power soft closed doors. So rather than having to slam the door, you just gently close it and the car takes care of the rest. That goes for all four doors. We get some upgraded interior components and we get ventilated rear seats on this model. Unique wheels are also part of the equation. Basically the top three models in the LX lineup get 22 inch wheels. Those are the ones that this model has on it right now. These are definitely large wheels, but I appreciate the fact that they still have a bit of cushion. So these are 50 series wheels. They're not 30 series or smaller wheels like you might find on some of the European competition. Not as much cushion as I would like, but at least it's not a rubber band wrapped around the wheel. If you want the ultimate Lexus LX 600, that's going to be the ultra luxury trim starting at $126,000 plus destination that gets you slightly different 22 inch wheels. And most importantly, it's a four seat vehicle with the mega thrones in the back. We also get active height control standard. There are a few options available on the other trims that you can stand alone select. At the moment, it appears that you're going to get the most interior color options. However, in the luxury and premium trims, ultra luxury is going to be black only, basically the same color that you saw in this model right here. With a price range of approximately $90,000 on up to just about $130,000, this is definitely within the pricing range of a wide variety of luxury SUVs and crossovers. Even something like a new Jeep Wagoneer could be considered some sort of competition to the Lexus. I think that Lexus has done a good job of updating the Lexus, but keeping it true to what Land Cruiser and LX shoppers have been interested in. They want something that's body on frame, something that's rugged, reliable, etc. Some folks are going to be disappointed that this is no longer a naturally aspirated V8 engine under the hood, but personally, I think this was exactly the right direction for Lexus to go, especially since I am up at around 8,000 feet where I am filming this right now, and this still feels very peppy, and that's all thanks to the turbocharged engine. Turbo engines are going to lose power at altitude as well, but it's going to be less noticeable in a modern turbo design, and it also gives us a ton of low end torque. You're going to notice that if you're towing, if you're hauling, or if you're off roading, the low end torque on this is much better than the V8 engine that it replaces. And even though it doesn't sound quite as good as the V8, it helps with the character of the vehicle. The LX is very hushed, very quiet on the inside, and this V6 is almost unnoticeable in terms of engine operation. I think it's a really, really good fit. Now, whether you should get this or get something like a Mercedes G Wagon, which is obviously going to be more expensive, or a Range Rover, which is going to be more off-road capable in a wide variety of situations, but again, more expensive, I will leave that up to you. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comments section below. If you haven't already done so, hit that subscribe button because I will have a full review when I can take this a little bit more aggressively off-road sometime later at home. Again, Lexus would really like to keep this scratch-free, dent-free, and shiny side up because only eight of them exist in the U.S. at this moment, but a lot of them have been produced and they are currently on a ship coming to the United States. So expect these to be on dealer lots sometime in the first quarter of 2022, most likely February or perhaps March.
In the meantime, again, hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. Find me over at facebook.com, Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.